Hello from the Forstronics YouTube channel. Welcome to building an adjustable LED drive circuit. And this is part two in a series of two. You can support Forstronics on the Forstronics Patreon page where you can get exclusive content, design files, and code even from this video series. So please check it out. If you haven't already, please subscribe to my channel. All right, let's get started with part two. This is a slide I shared in part one just to remind you what we covered in part one and what we're going to cover in part two. In part two, we're going to focus on the LED driver circuit demo. So we're going to show a demo of the driver circuit in action, powering a strip of LEDs, and we'll have the current being adjusted slowly. So we'll see the LEDs get brighter and less bright and then bright again. And we'll see that in a video. And we'll also see the circuit itself. We'll look at the PCB layout and we'll look at some example circuit measurements. We'll look at the current so you can kind of see the effects of the switching and the current flow through the inductor. We'll look at the efficiency of the chip. So we'll make some measurements to calculate the efficiency of our chip for the power in and the power out. We'll also look at the current waveform when you use a pulse width modulated signal to dim it a bit. And as a reminder, if you join my Patreon page, you can get the PCB layout design files from this video. You can get a copy of the bomb. You can also get a copy of the Arduino code that I use for the example with the PWM control. And then finally, this video, this part two, will have some extra measurement data and will review the Arduino code in the extended video version on Patreon. Okay, here is the video and I'm showing the LED board that I'm using to test my LED driver circuit. This is a Samsung Horticulture LED board Gen 2. I can share the, the full name of it in the details section of the video. But I'm just showing you the different LEDs on there. There's the wires to connect it. And there's our driver circuit. This is the circuit you've been seeing in the schematic and we'll see the PCB layout for. I'm just using screw terminals. So this is the LED, the high side and low side of the LED board. And over here is the power source connected to a power supply. And the input's gonna be 50 volts. These two wires are ground and the PWM signal from the microcontroller circuit that we're gonna see. Here, this big component here, this is the inductor. This is the largest component on the board. Here is the LED driver IC. Here is the Dachatki diode. This is the capacitor that keeps the input voltage at a steady level. And then this is the sense resistor. And then we have the other capacitor, the, the 10 nanofarad capacitor, and the current limiting resistor you can't see it in this picture. So let's continue on with the video. Now you can see the microcontroller, so it's an ESP32, and if you watch my other videos, you might recognize this as the Forstronics ESP32 development board, which I have more videos on. And then I'm going to turn on my power supply to provide the 50 volts, and then I also have a USB plug to power up the microcontroller. So I, I turn on the power supply, the LEDs turn on right away, then I'm plugging in the microcontroller to start the control program. So if you notice, you're going to see the LEDs start to get brighter. And they're slowly getting brighter and brighter as we ramp up the current to them. So I paused the video. Now, it's, it's sometimes hard to tell with a video how bright the LEDs are, but I basically have really strong sunglasses on because these LEDs get so bright. So we're going to see them get to their brightest. Then they're going to slowly start to dim until they almost turn off. And then we'll see them get bright again. So all I do in this Arduino program to control the LEDs is I'm using a loop that slowly raises the duty cycle of the PWM control signal until it reaches 100%. I then pause for a second, then I ramp it down the opposite way. Now you might notice there is a little discontinuity in the LED brightness. That's because the IC that, that drives the LEDs, it can only adjust from 10% to 100% and 100% to 10%. So you can't go from 0% to 100% 100% to zero. So you go from 100 to 10, then it drops to zero, and then when you start to ramp it up, it jumps from zero to 10, and then up to 100. So you don't have the full range of adjustment, but almost. All right, now that we've seen the design in action, let's look at the PCB layout. So this PCB layout was done based on the schematic I showed in part one. So here we have the board, it's pretty small, right? And you can see the two screw terminal connectors, DCC and ground, this is where the power supply connects. 
Over here is where the LED board or LED strip connects. And you have the high side right here and then the low side for the LED. So we have our power coming in here. Here is C1, the 10 microfarad capacitor. And as you know from part one, we want to have it as close to V in of the tip as possible. So that's why I have it right against here. This right here is the chip itself, the IC. Here is the shot key diode. Here's my current limiting resistor and the 10 nanofarad resistor. Here's where the input of the pulse width modulated signal comes in. So the power supply is going to provide 50 volts. It's going to flow through R1, which is our sense resistor, right? This is our 0.1 ohm resistor that sets the max current to one amp. So this pin right here on the chip is V in, and then this other pin on the other side is the current sense in. So those two pins are monitoring the voltage on each side of the sense resistor, drive it to a certain value, which essentially controls the current flowing through the resistor. And the current flows through the resistor, through to the LEDs, through the LEDs, back into here, and then to the inductor, right? And notice wherever I have power flowing, I have nice wide traces, right? This is to reduce the resistance of the traces so that we get the best efficiency possible and we're not burning power on the PCB. And of course, for the inductor, we want to get rid of any parasitic inductance in the traces. That's another reason why you want to have them wide and flat. So the current's going to flow into the inductor to this switch pin. So here is the switch pin of the IC and then to D1. So remember, the IC has a switch that's controlled with a pulse width modulated signal. That switch either closes and so current flows into the IC to ground or it's open and the current flows out of the inductor through the diode back into this loop. Here's the control pin. So these green things are vias that connect the top and bottom layer. So here I'm connecting the trace, the control pin trace, and I route that on the bottom of the board. This is a two layer board. Then I bring another via to bring it back up to the top layer and connect to the current limiting resistor R2, which connects to the PWM input. And then C2 is just a bypass capacitor for noise. That connects this trace and the ground. And so wherever you're seeing a trace that's not the signal flowing, that's called the ground plane, right? And I have these vias that are connected to ground that connect to the bottom layer of the board. And wherever there's not a trace on the bottom layer of the board, that's also the ground plane. That's where the ground current flows to get returned to the power supply. This is just a simple two layer PCB. I'm just using a one ounce copper pour. And you can see the size of it is only about, uh, what is it, about 34 millimeters by about 23 millimeters. All right, now that we've seen the PCB, let's look at some example measurements of our circuit in action. So here you're looking at a screen capture from an oscilloscope. And this is a Keysight oscilloscope. Keysight makes the best oscilloscopes. And I have a current probe connected. The current probe connects around the wire and measures the wire's magnetic field. It then turns that into an equivalent voltage. And then the oscilloscope captures that and turns it into a current reading. If you're not familiar with the oscilloscope, this y-axis is the current value, right? And this x-axis is time. So what you can notice is you notice this waveform. And you notice the waveform comes up right around one amp, right? We can see at the lowest part of the waveform, we're at 700 some milliamps, and at the highest part, we're actually above one amp. And actually, if you look down here at the measurement area, you can see the highest peak of this waveform is about 1.1 amps. Frequency of this waveform is about 200 kilohertz, and then the peak, the peak value of this waveform is about 400 milliamps. So this waveform along with this area underneath the waveform represents the current flowing through the inductor. So if you remember, we talked about the fact that the inductor's current's gonna vary a little bit, right? Because of the switching action of the LED driver IC. So that's what we're seeing here. So this upslope is when the switch is closed and there's a path through the inductor to ground. And so the current starts to rise and the inductor's storing energy in its magnetic field. Then once the voltage or current, well, I say voltage because it's the voltage across the sense resistor, which you know, it represents the current flow, gets to a max value, the switch then is opened. And then this is the magnet, this is 
the current dropping as the magnetic field around the inductor collapses and induces current, and that current flows through the diode B1. The, ma the max current flowing or the effective current flowing through the, the LEDs and through the inductor represents the RMS value of this waveform combined with this current underneath the waveform. This, this frequency that we see of 200 kilohertz, this is essentially the squeaking, switching frequency of the internal clock in the chip. Now, the clock can go up to one megahertz, but based on the voltage and current values you use, it self-adjusts the clock for the best operation, I guess. So we're getting about 200 kilohertz. Now, you can see this is noisy, right? This is one of the trade-offs to get in the good efficiency from a switch-based solution versus a linear solution. But the idea is, even with this switching, this varying current on the top, because the frequency is so high, you'll never notice that, the, the, the slight flickering with your eyes, you'll never notice that. If we assume the RMS value of this, and to calculate RMS value of a triangle waveform, this isn't quite a triangle waveform, but close to it, that's, you use the peak voltage, not the not the peak to peak voltage, but the peak voltage, which would be 200 millivolts through the center of this waveform, divided by the square root of three. So that's gonna give us about 101 millivolts I keep saying millivolts, but I should say milliamps, excuse me, above the center of this waveform. And to me, that means our effective current isn't quite one amp. We're somewhere below that, but we're close to it. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. This next capture, this is a capture with the same oscilloscope using a current probe again. So we're measuring the same spot we were, except now we have a control signal of about 50% duty cycle going into the control pin from the microcontroller. So that's why we're seeing the current get pulsed on instead of being on constantly like it was in the other screen capture. We've also zoomed out, so we're looking at a bigger chunk of time. So this fuzzy green area on the top of the pulses, this is that same sawtooth or triangle waveform we were just looking at. It's just that we're zoomed out so it's all bunched together. And we zoomed out so that we could see the frequency of these pulses, which is about 500 hertz, which is what the data sheet recommended to control the, uh, to go in the control pin. So we're seeing the effects of the control PWM signal. It basically creates a PWM pulse current output when you use that control signal. And it's 500 hertz, which once again, these pulses would cause the LEDs to flicker. But because it's such a high frequency, our eyes don't notice it, right? So it just looks like a dimmed LED. And so this is an, the LED at about half its brightness. And then finally, I wanted to talk about the efficiency. So what we're looking at is I took a picture of the power supply powering the LED board when we were at max value. So here we're not making any adjustment we're seeing 50 volts and about 840 milliamps. The power supply is putting out about 42 watts. So then I took a high precision DMM and I measured the voltage drop across the LED board. So this is not the voltage drop that includes the sense resistor and the inductor. This is the voltage drop just across the, the LEDs. If we measured it across everything, we would see about 50 volts, right? And we know the voltage is going to be lower across the LEDs because this is a buck converter. Now, if we want to cal calculate the power that the LEDs are consuming, and we assume that, that there's one amp of current, we just multiply the voltage by the current to get the power. So we get about 41.57 watts. So when I calculate the power efficiency, and you do that by taking the ratio of the power in, I shouldn't say in, I should say power out, divided by the power in, so we have those two power values, and we times that by 100 to get it to as a percentage, we get 98.8%. And when I saw this, red flags went off in my head, because if you remember, the data sheet specs the chip for a max efficiency of 97%. So I said to myself, there's no way we're getting almost 2% higher than the max spec. So what I said was, I thought in my head, and I said, well, when I looked at that oscilloscope reading of the current, I kind of knew we weren't getting about, we were getting close to one amp, but we probably weren't getting one amp. So what I did next is I said, well, let me assume that I might be getting the max efficiency of 97%. And so when I did that, I take the input power because we know that's accurate. And I times it by the ratio, which is the efficiency percentage divided by 100, and I get 40.74 watts. 
If I divide that by 41.57 volts, because I know that's accurate, because I'm measuring it with a high accuracy DMM, then I get an amp value of 0.98 amps, which makes more sense because we weren't quite seeing an effective current of, of one amp in that oscilloscope screenshot. And I thought to myself, well, why is this? I'm not quite getting what the chip is rated for. And I'm assuming that, you know, the company making this chip is not going to give me a bad or misleading rating. So I poked around. So first thing I did was I measured my sense resistor, a sense resistor that was not on the board. And I bought sense resistors that were 100 milliohms, which should give me, you know, one amp max. When I measured it with my DMM, I got about 100 milliohms, which I should do because it's a 1% tolerance resistor. But when I measured my sense resistor that was on my board, I got 110 milliohms. And I realized the fact that when the sense resistor is soldered to the board and the, the pads on the board, the solder with the pads adds that extra 10 milliohms is what I realized, which makes sense because as you bring the ohm value of the sense resistor up from 100 milliohms, the max current that the chip puts out drops. So the fact that I had a little higher sense resistance than I wanted caused my current to not quite get up to one amp. What I'm realizing is what I probably need to do is buy a sense resistor that's somewhere between 90 milliohms and 95 milliohms to get closer to one amp. Before I conclude, I just wanted to show you the bomb for the PCB board or for the circuit, I should say. And of course, I'll have a spreadsheet of this available on Patreon. And that's it for part two. If you have any questions, feel free to use the comment section. If you think you have anything to add or something I missed, please use the comment section below. And uh, thank you for watching.